<laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> this is Cat Day with SBM Magazine, and we have Patrick Hat, Patrick Stampy, and Dennis Hatch. Patrick, take it away. All right. Uh, I'd like to just say a couple things real quick. Dennis Hatch, you know, if you don't know Dennis Hatch, you might not know Cool too well because he's a known name and uh, 2009 Moscone Cup MVP, U.S. Open. He played Buddy Hall like when he was, what was it? You were like 19 or something. Mm -hmm. You played in the 20. final. Yeah, uh, I was 20 years old. 20. 20 years old. That is incredible. That's an incredible story right there to just, <laughs> and then to have to go against the rifleman. Wow. That, and y'all went hill, hill, right? Yeah, hill, hill. I broke dry and he ran out, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> you just got a little bad luck in there in the end. That, that, you that's know, it, that's how the balls roll sometimes. But I, that was. I think I think still to this day, I'm the youngest player to ever reach the finals of the U.S. Open. I know Clancy uh, Kachi had done it. I think he was 22, though. Um, I'm not sure. But I think still to this day, same thing with the Moscone Cup Rookie MVP Award. No one's ever won that award. Only me. That's great. Well, the USA rookie. There's been right. European rookies, but not the USA rookie. Right. Maybe we could review that getting into it as we're getting started here, like like review the 2009 Moscone Cup and how you got that MVP, who all you beat, and that kind of thing, if you if you can remember back that far. No, I'm just playing around. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick, take it away. What are your thoughts on that? Like, like who all was in? Like, who did you be, was one of the major players you beat back then? Uh, well, I, I think I was four or five and one. The only match I lost was Corey and I playing doubles. But I beat uh, me and Johnny won. We beat Darren and Mika, I believe it was. Um, and then I won singles matches against two of them against Niels. Uh, and I don't remember the other one that I won. And I know I won my um, the opening round five on five match. But the two big wins that I did have were against Niels. One was uh, six to two. And the other one was to put us on the hill uh, to go up 10 six, I believe the score was. And I beat him six nothing. I played absolutely flawless. That's great. Nice. Yeah. Nice. And so that just, if anyone, you know, if we show this, and we have this with the uh, article, which is sometimes what we do, then I just like to open up with that to give everybody a little history on you. And, you know, so um, just know that you know exactly what you're talking about when you're talking about these events. So let's get started with the U.S. Open and, and who all maybe do you have like a top five picks of challengers in the U.S. Open you think might win it? Well, I mean, you always have to go with the, the younger generation. Obviously, Fedor Gorst is, like, top of his game right now. Um, that kid is a, just a pure animal, all games. Uh, his banking ability, his one-pocket ability, and obviously his rotation game is, uh, I would say, probably right now the best in the world. Um, so my picks to win would be, um, even though I hate to say this, <laughs> a few Europeans, uh, Filler, Shaw, Gorst, um, American, Shane Van Boning. Uh, and I think the, the surprise is going to be Shane Wolford. That kid is going to be a, uh, a talent. Uh, you know, I know Shane he's still Wolford, young. I'll have to look into him. I wasn't familiar with him. Yeah, he's a lefty. He's a big guy like me, and he's going to be a force to be reckoned with. Uh, I think in the future he'll be, if not the best American player, he's going to be one of the top two or three without a doubt. What do you think about some of the Asian players like um, Kopin Yi and Aloysius Yap? Yeah, they can all win too. There's so yeah. many now, so many uh, countries and, and so many players and, and young men and even some of the older guys that can still compete. Um, you get, you know, Kevin Chang, uh, Oi. I mean, there's so many of them. But they're, it just, it's a, a coin flip as to who could win. Right. It's kind of a... 
at the beginning, kind of luck of the draw type thing to where you get a few matches under your belt and then you can get rolling and get comfortable. But if you start out with a real tough draw, you, you could go two and out. So it's, you know, there's a lot of variables to play a part in winning the U.S. Open. It's not just playing perfect. Right. There's also going to be probably a match that one of these guys have that they were probably going to lose and something turned tables, either they, the guy scratched on the break on the hill or he missed nine or, you know, because every time I seem to win a tournament, there's always that one match that I could have lost that I won that, you know, uh, turned the tides for me that gave me, got me rolling to win the event. Right. So you're saying like, it doesn't hurt to have a little luck in there. You know, you want to be playing lights <laughs> out sure too, by the way. I got yeah, you have to have luck. Luck has to be on your side in some way, shape, or form. I mean, obviously, playing ability and playing great get you there. But if you don't get the rolls or a few rolls, you could play perfect and still lose. And that's that's the brutal part of the game. Um, I've been to many tournaments where I've played some of the best pool in my life and didn't even get in the money. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you play the balls four or five times and don't get a shot. You have to push and, you know, or, or some guy misses two or three times and hooks you. And the next thing you know, you, you never missed a ball, but you lost and there's nothing you can really do about it. Right. Aloysius yeah, Stapp certainly had the luck on his side in the Seabirds, the Michigan Open. I didn't watch, but I, I heard there was a, a, yeah, I heard there were a few things that helped him win. But that jump shot that he made was amazing. oh my god, that eight ball, it was beautiful. Yeah. Yep. He dumped that and drew it back, length yeah. of table. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he hit you couldn't hit it any better, that's for sure. That was gorgeous. And uh, then he said it was a hanger. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, hey, we're glad like to Let's see. Let's see what. Well, let me think about some stuff here. Um, uh, Moscone Cup coming up. We got the U.S. Open coming up. You're getting back in the game. Maybe tell us a little bit about that. She was uh, telling me you you wanting to make a run at it again. Well, now that my business is is successful, and I, I can hopefully in January try to find some time to not compete um, full time, but I would like to go out and start playing again and just get my feet wet and see if I can still, I'll be 52 in January. So, um, you know, I just wanna see if I can still compete with those guys. I know in the bottom of my heart, I can still compete. Um, I feel like I still have as much talent as I ever did. I just don't know about my eyesight and my nerves at 52, are they gonna hold up? <laughs> um, but we shall see. <laughs> Well, you know me at 50 i'm rooting for you for sure i know that thank you have you been practicing <laughs> daily me no i haven't hit a ball but i did just go downstairs and hit some before this interview with you guys and i, <laughs> I, did, I did a little trick shot and i hit some balls and i still feel like i have the talent the talent is there um without a doubt is again as i said my eyesight um <laughs> Well, you know well, you can get those me. special glasses like the drill instructor wears. Yeah, know, yeah, these the ones that go way up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I know I'm wrong, but I'd rather play bad than wear those glasses. I'd rather well, play bad. I, mean, I want to play good, even if I have to look stupid doing it. If I, I just want to win. <laughs> right. That's that's uh, what I'll it never... takes to go. Yeah, That's I'll why you're lose. the player, I'm the writer. You're the player, I'm the writer. <laughs> I'll never lose that one win, that fight. That's always going to be there. So that was part of, of what made me such a great player. Is I, I never, re, you know, I, I never gave up. I always wanted to win. Even if I was down 10 to 1 in the race to 11, I still tried to fight back. And uh, I just, I always felt like I was the better player and that I should win, even though I didn't always win. They call you the hatch man. The Hatchet Man. The Hatchet Man. How'd you get that name? Yeah. My dad. Your dad? Yeah, my dad was a great player. He uh, really? obviously worked. Yeah, he worked for the railroad, um, had four kids. I have three sisters. We lived in Bancroft, Michigan on a farm. And he used to go to Lansing and play with Jimmy Mattia and, and Rick Lefevre and a bunch of other guys. Uh, Steve Miserak was there a few times. And um, he was a great player. He just, he worked for the railroad, Grand Trunk Railroad. And he raised four kids, so he didn't have time to to do it full time. Right. Really great pool. Him and my uncle are the, the only two that ever taught me really how to play pool at all. 
So how old were you when you first started playing? Well, there, there's a few variables to that story. So I, when I was two, I, there's a picture of me on the floor with just a shaft right. and, and a cue ball at uh -huh. two years old. So I'm crawling on the floor with a shaft in my hand trying to hit a cue ball. But I, when I started playing, basically, when I was old enough to even hit a ball on the floor or, or reach the pool table, um, at nine years old, I played my first state championship at Hall of Fame Billiards in Lansing. Um, I think it was a uh, Kansas, uh, Lansing, Michigan. Okay, Michigan. All right. Yeah. So yeah, I've been playing since I was very little. That's great. So what would you say? What would you say are the like top five player or top ten list in the world right now? Would you say if you had a a pick of like players worldwide you mentioned filler in there well they're and, all in there i mean there's so many names the asians and i can't remember their names Copin Yi, uh kevin chang you have filler gorst jason shaw shane van boning sky i think is capable of winning anything um i mean there's just so many names you know so that, how, how would you rate like the players today as of the past like say for instance like if you could compare when you were playing Buddy Hall in the finals, you know, if to contrast that with today, like it seems like the U.S. Open has become more of a international event now. Well, back then it was too. I mean, Efren was at the U.S. Open. All the Filipinos, you know, the the U.S. Open has always been international. Mm -hmm. uh, it just might be a little bigger now, but it, it's hard to decipher. For example, like. What was it like then compared to now? Because everything has changed. The conditions, the cloth, the table, the size of the pockets, the balls. Um, back when we played, God, I sound so old. <laughs> back when we played, um, you know, in the 80s and 90s, we played on Steven's thick, slow cloth. And you had to have a stroke to, to get the ball around the table. And every match you played was like a Parika, Buddy, Varner, Archer, um, you know, Seagull, Strickland, there, there were so many, Rempe, you know, everybody, I mean, everybody that played could beat you. There was really no easy draw back in the day. Great fix, Mark Wilson. There were players that, you know, honestly, everybody played great, just like they do now. But if I had to compare, here's my example. If you took today's players and you put them in our time back then on the, that cloth with those balls and those tables, we would rob them. Filler, yeah. Filler and Shaw, and no offense to them, they're champions and great players, but on these tables, it was a whole different ball game. It was like playing on mud with, with tight pockets, and you had to hit everything hard to make the cue ball move around the table. I think that us in that time, we would win. I think if you took those players now and you could move them forward into this time, that these kids would rob us. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it, games, it's almost like a different game in a lot of ways, isn't it? It is. Hold on one second. Okay. I got you. That was my fiance. <laughs> um, but you have to take into consideration just everything that's changed. I mean, not that, and I don't want to come across to sound like bitter, like these guys can't play these days because they, they're all great players and champions. Obviously, Jason Shaw is a great player. Phil is a great player. They have great strokes. Gorst, all the uh, Oriental players. But the conditions favor just everyone and anyone. You really don't need a stroke to play anymore because the rails are so bouncy. The cloth is so fast. And they're changing the balls. And like when we went to tournaments, we, the tables were not as nice as they are now. They weren't as new as they are now. We were playing on old cloth, beat up balls, you know, just it, it was a little tougher back then is all I'm trying to say. I think that if you took the players from back then and tried to put them in today's era with, with these tables and these conditions, they would probably be able to compete somewhat. But again, I mean, are you bringing them back in their prime? And bringing them against these guys? Are you bringing me back when I was in the 90s, like the best player in the world two or three times to play these guys now? Or do you, are you bringing them back, you know, at 40 or 50 like me and playing them? I mean, if you put prime against prime, I think it would be a bullfight. I think there would be two, they would headbutt. Yeah. 
I think it's, it's it. a hypothetical, you know, I know it's hypothetical, but yeah. um, it, it's interesting to think about a little bit, but you know, it'll never happen. So yeah, I well, understand. You never know. It might happen. I want to see the hatchet man chopping them up. Oh, <laughs> I want to chop them up, but I will say this. And I know people talk about him a lot now, but you know, and it's not, it's not funny that people laugh at him. The man has some, some issues internally and, and hopefully he gets help or gets some medicine for it. But I'll tell you this, and this is my opinion. I think that Earl Strickland is the best player to ever live and play the game. And that includes these guys today, Filler, Shaw, Gorst. I think Earl would outplay them all in his prime. I don't think that there's anyone on the planet that could beat Earl Strickland in his, in his prime. And that's coming from me. And I have a huge ego. And I, you know, <laughs> I, I feel the same way about myself. Had I quit drinking in my prime, I would have, I felt like I would have been another Earl or better, but I can tell you that, that that's my opinion. And I think that Earl is probably the best player that ever lived. Um, even though, even after the goal, Efren Reyes. Yeah, I think, well, Efren was better all around. Uh, he was okay. great at everything. He okay. was a, he, I think Efren would be the greatest all around player. Okay. If it was a rotation game, nine ball or 10 ball, all I right. think that Earl in his prime would just destroy everyone. Okay. That's my opinion. Earl, I mean, he was, su I mean, he's such a, when in his prime, when I saw him, I saw that color of money and I think he got in his own head or he would have just destroyed Rez and that. I mean, but he, he was up like 20 racks into the last day or something. And then you saw him getting in his own head, and I, I, yeah. I really he'd have won that if he'd have just stayed with it. Yeah, he was. Uh, what was he? Twenty or twenty-five games ahead, and then he, he kind of fell apart. But I mean, listen, it's happened to all of us, right? Um, I think Shane last time he played Dennis had him, but he was up like twenty or thirty games, and he won Hill Hill. Um, I've done it. I mean, we've all done it. We've all fell apart. Obviously, Earl explodes more than normal. Um, mm -hmm. But again, he, I, if I'm not mistaken, he is clinically diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Right. So I, I don't. Yeah, I, I feel him on that. I'm, I am too. And uh, yeah, I think it's bipolar one. I get a mixed up bipolar one, bipolar two. It's all bipolar well, to me. You know, people like to watch Earl play and they'd say, oh, I want to see him. You know, do you want to, do you really want to watch him play or do you want to watch him blow up? Because when I see him blow up, I don't think it's funny. It makes me want to cry because I know that internally yeah. the man is suffering. You're you're looking at a man who was the best that ever played the game and was a champion and is now fighting battles in his own brain, um, whether it be because of, uh, of bipolar disorder or because of he still feels because he still wants to win and he can't or, or because of everything combined. Um, I don't find it funny at all. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. And like no, grew up serious. at yeah. I, I yeah, don't know. I, I, you know, if I'm going to see Earl serious. play, I want to watch Earl play great. When I watch Earl play, I don't want to watch him play bad and blow up and, and, and start screaming at the crowd. That's not what I want to see. I want to see hey, the man play. Speaking of him, how it all relates to the Moscone Cup, talking about that, um, what, is, is he an option for this year's Moscone Cup like last year's as well? I would say no, not after what uh, transpired at Turning Stone. Um, I think he quit right in the middle of the match, if I'm not mistaken. He was screaming at the crowd, and I saw him throwing some punches and stuff. But just I think that moving forward that they're going to try to focus on um, guys like Shane, Sky, uh, Oscar, the guys in the top five or ten of the point rankings, uh, Shane Wolford. I think that they're going to continue to try to stay with the younger generation and, and, and be done with us older. <laughs> yeah. We, we be done what do you think about guys. that? Like, what are your thoughts, real quick, on the um, younger? It seems like we've got Eric Roberts and uh, some of these other young uh, talents coming up. Who's Eric Roberts? Um, he's, he's just a junior player that's really been killing it. You know, as far as I know, I, I, I only 
know a little bit, yo. Know, I'm trying to get more into the junior players myself so we can cover these. We've got Thomas Swain. He's out of Florida here. He's getting in the SVB Open, and we co we're covering him in the next issue. We're trying to get more juniors because we know that's the future of the game and, and cover that. So we've been, you know, Savannah Easton did an article there with us. And uh, so that that's great. And we want to see that because without them, you know, there's no future in the game. Right. I just think that um, it's hard to say, you know, I mean, like me, not that I was a rookie, but technically I was a rookie. But when I was a rookie, it was 2009. It was 13 years ago. I mean, I was 40, 39 years old. I was no rookie. You know what I mean? I had been playing the game for 25 years, 30 years at that point. Um so I wouldn't consider myself a rookie when I went out there to play in the Moscone Cup, even though technically I was a rookie. But the younger kids like Cash Keaton and the kid you just mentioned and all these other younger guys, um, you, you don't just walk out to the Moscone Cup and perform. You, you have to pay your dues and you have to earn your badges and, and you have to be prepared to play. Um, there might be a time when they can just at 18 or 19 or 20 or you know whatever you have to be to play, just jump in the box and play and start to win matches. But I just don't see that happening. I could be wrong. I could be stuck in my ways as an old man, but I think they need to get out there. They need to play their uh, junior events, turn pro, playing pro events and compete. And then once they can compete with Kane and Sky and all the Orientals and the Filipinos and, and then give them their chance. Mm -hmm. um, when you guys, you have guys out there traveling right now, paying their dues, Oscar. He's going to Russia and the world championships and doing this. I want to know, this. now that you mentioned him, Oscar, why haven't we seen him in the Moscone Cup? He's always up there. I don't understand that. Uh, I don't really know how to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know oh, what I'm saying? it's a touch. Okay, yeah, well, move it. Him and I played on. each other. When him and I played, he played with each other, there, were, there was a comment made and it was taken out of context. And I think he was just trying to be funny and lighten the situation. And, and for some reason, they, they, they just completely bashed him. And, and I don't know if he's been on the team since. He may have. Um, but I, I think that that might have something to do with it. And I also think that they think that maybe there are some players that play better than him, which uh, isn't really necessarily the case. I think Oscar is capable of playing just as good as anyone. I've seen Oscar play perfect matches, and I've seen Oscar play horrible. I've seen Shane play perfect matches, and I've seen Shane play horrible. I think we all have, especially in the in the Cup. Same with Jason Shaw. I've seen him play great. I've seen him play horrible. It happens to all of us. You can't uh, take anyone out or, or chastise or, or say, oh, this guy can't play, or he can't be. He dogs it every time he plays because hey. that's not true. You're going to have good matches and you're going to have bad matches. You're going to make balls that are people are going to be like, oh, my God, I can't believe he made that. And then there's going to be balls that we miss just because we took our eye off the ball that are simply routine and easy that, that an APA five could make. Right. You know, and, it, and as I said, it happens to all of us. Then the last matchroom event that they had before the Asian nine ball, they changed the way they were um racking the balls yes where they put the nine ball on the point instead of the yep. the one ball and i think that threw a lot of the players off plus they had to shoot out of the box well i think that that makes it fair i think that's a great idea because the if you're playing nine balls or if the breaking from the rail with the one on the spot the corner ball goes every time you know and you're basically hitting them soft and playing position and it's not really a skill at that point it, it's a routine yeah. Um, you know, it's like breaking and playing position for the one and the break, and then you run out. Does it take a little skill to to do that? Yes, but to me, that's not. Again, I sound old. Um, it's not the way we used to play pool. Back right. in the day, you hit them, and where they landed, you, you'd run out. But now it's not about that. Now it's about, you know, it's about the break. It's about the mental game, and it's about racking the balls and touching the one, and and you know, cutting them and, and playing the corner ball and. and dragging the cue ball up to the top of the table and the one goes cross corner and they play position for the one ball and, you know, just what it is now, but I would rather see that than see them, you know, break from the rail and make the corner ball every single time and, and play position for the one. Then, then, you know, at least if you break from the box, you have to cut them 
and there's a little bit of luck involved. The cue ball gets kicked around. So it's, it's fair for everyone. Everyone yeah. has to learn how to do it and everyone should be able to do it. Right. Um, so I don't think there's a problem with it. Yeah. I but think they, they played that they had the, the rack and the nine on the spot. Right. And then they had rack and the one on the spot. But from my perspective, I was thinking about like, you know, nine ball really is a break and run out game, though. You know, it, it's like if you alternate breaks and you have legitimate races to nine and not these carnival races to four, that's a joke. Yeah, you know, you know I have my door is locked and I have to let my fiance in. OK, I got Ten you. Seconds. Hey, cat. Hold up. I'm trying to. I don't know what I did. I changed the view on my. You're all right. I can still see you. Okay. Um, well, we've got a lot of great information in a short time here. I, I really appreciate the time here. I'm what sorry I had my. Yeah, let's that? talk about the Moscone. This year's Moscone. Yeah, yeah. Let's get like. Who have they selected? We've got Shane Van Boning and Filler selected so far. And, and who all that's, it. that's it. I think that's like, it. Like, do we have, are we thinking about, like, who would you assemble if you assembled a team this year for the Moscone Cup? I would assemble the guys that are out there competing, playing in the events, doing all the traveling, putting in their dues, and, you know. Um, and for me, it's not all about winning. Like, uh, you know, you don't have to win tournaments just to be picked for the Moscone Cup team. Just because a guy's playing good in tournaments doesn't mean he's going to perform well in the Moscone Cup. Uh, I would have to look at all the variables. I would definitely take Shane Wolford this year and probably throw him in the mix. Um, mm -hmm. But obviously, you get the usual suspects, Shane Van Boning. And Shane is doing the, the best thing he could ever do for himself. He's traveling the world. Right? He's in the Philippines. He's playing all these guys, these long races. Even if it's just an exhibition match, I think they're betting a little something, but it's the best thing that he could possibly do for himself because we all know that Shane hasn't performed the greatest in the Moscone Cup. Um, not not, um, not uh, all of them, you know what I mean? He, he'll go in and play a good match and then play bad. Or that, play is a, that is a criticism of his game, but... The players, they've got to realize that the Moscone Cup is an exhibition tournament. It's not a legitimate tournament. It's no, more and like it's a race to five. Huh? It's a race to five. I mean, it's a crapshoot. You miss one ball and you're liable to get beat, uh, you know, 5-1, five, 5-0. One, five, and there's so much pressure on you between the crowd, uh, the cameras, uh, you know, the whole country pulling for you. I mean, it's not, it's not as easy as people think. I, I don't know. They think that we're like robots and we should just go out there and play great every time. And if we miss a ball, then we get booed. But I think it's, it's a little easy. out of control it's myself. It's easy sitting there from the couch, you know, when you're really? sitting on the couch watching it, yep. you're making every ball, right? Yeah. So what do they call them? Uh, Monday morning quarterback. <laughs> 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 but yeah, um, yeah. I, I would definitely take, the guys who are out there playing, the guys who are out there gambling, because I, it's not about all just tournaments for me. The guy's out there playing a lot of money matches. That puts a lot of pressure on him. He's out there in the grease all the time. Oscar, he's playing Johnny Moore. He just played Johnny Moore again. Or he's playing Johnny Moore again. Shane's out there playing. Um, you can't – I mean, Sky's won the MVP, what, two, three times? You can't leave him off the team. So you got Shane, Sky, probably Oscar, Shane Wolford, and I don't know who my fifth pick would be, but um, – Again, you have to look at, is Oscar doing good in tournaments? Is Oscar winning matches when he plays for money? Mm -hmm. uh, I know Johnny Mora beat him. Um, so if he continues to get beat by John Moore and he goes to all these tournaments and he never gets like the top, let's say 12, mm -hmm. then obviously you probably wouldn't want to put him on the team because he doesn't have a lot of top five finishes, even though he's out there competing. But um, there's just, it, you know what? You could pick who, I could pick my team. You could pick your team, Patrick. You could pick a team, and whoever we throw out there, if they get beat, we're all going to get right. thrown under the bus. Yeah, so yeah. It doesn't matter who we or they I, or Jeremy. I feel picks. like they, 
I feel like they did that a little bit to Mark Wilson. Like, you know, I think he was a good team captain. And uh, I, I'd like, what about Dennis Hatch's captain, though? Well, I would love to be captain. <laughs> I mean, I'm a little biased here, but I think um, I think that I would be a great captain. I just think that I have that drive and energy, and I think that I have some skills that I've learned over the years. Uh, just practice games and routines so that I could take to them and teach them. Um, and I, I just think that, you know, I, I obviously I I think I'm a, I would be a great captain, but I have talked to Emily about it a few times and asked her if I could be co-captain or captain next year if something was to happen, even this year. And she said, well, think about it. And that was about the extent of it. But um, I would love to be captain. I, I would absolutely love it. I think that the crowd, the fans would absolutely love it because the Europeans, either they love me or they hate me and the American fans love me. And I think it would be great for everyone just to have me, even as a co-captain on the team, I think it would bring more excitement to the cup just to have me there. That's or, really the main thing about it. You know, I think, what are we, what are we set at now? They've got like, how many wins? They've got like 12 wins, but they've got like 13 wins. We've got 12 or something like that. I think it's closer. It's tied, if I'm not mistaken. It's real close, though. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be there this year. I'll be in the stands. Right. It'll be interesting. I'll, hey, uh, I'll be a spectator. <laughs> I, I wanted to let y'all know real quick. I've got to check in on something. And so I'm going to have to cut this short, but Kat, I was going to see if you could continue on with him here. And uh, I've, we've got enough where I've got a great article already. Um, maybe if you had any um, other thoughts real quick, I, I'm sorry about this hatch. I just had my son in today and everything, and it's just been chaos. I understand. All right, but so I hope I'm your son okay. Yeah, I appreciate it. it. And for the viewers out there, uh, we'll get with you again as well, you know, hopefully. And uh, this has been great so far. I really appreciated it. We've got a lot of good material. And uh, maybe just continue on if you have a few more questions, Kat. And Dennis, thank you again, and I appreciate you, and you're an inspiration to people, especially, you know, I, I wanted to get into more, but I've just, we'll, hopefully we'll get together again soon, and I, I want to talk about the, you know, abstaining from drinking and that kind of thing, too, because I think, you know, that's a big story in the game, you know, and it, I, I'd like to tie that in with how it all relates, but Y'all have a well, great day, that, and I'm going to jump that off That is here. my biggest accomplishment by far. How long have you been? Um, how long has it been for you? Seven years, one month, and four days. That's great. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, I just try to just go one day at a time. Right. That's all it is, is one day at a time. You just can't get comfortable. That's all. If you get right. comfortable, you know. I just know that if I pick up that first drink, that everything's going to change. So today I choose not to pick up that first drink. Exactly. That's all that matters. I don't pick up the first one. I'll never drink again. Right. Yep. Well, Pretty easy. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. <laughs> what you got to do is just walk away. And it's not easy. Yeah. I mean, it is, it's easy. The, the process is easy because just like I said, if you don't pick up the first drink, right. you'll never drink. Yeah, but that is so hard to do. Even after seven years, I still have that little uh, devil or demon. Devil on your shoulder. <laughs> one, you can have a couple. Just try, you know, maybe one glass of wine, but no, yeah, it doesn't right. work. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. <laughs> <Nope>. <laughs> One's too many, and a thousand's not enough. Right. Yeah. Yeah. My husband quit drinking. I think 30, 40, about thirty some years ago, and. He's much better now. Yeah, me too. Yeah, he just said I'm not no doing it no more, and he quit. So, but yeah, was, my fiance says that I'm allergic to alcohol. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So you got started playing pool from just being a toddler. And when was your first pro game? I was nine in nine. Uh, Lansing. Yep, at a state in Lansing, championship. Michigan. Okay. Hall of Fame billiards in Lansing, Michigan. Yep. Right. And did you win there? No, I didn't. No. I I don't even. Yeah. Right. I think I had to play Jimmy Mattia. Um, oh dear. <laughs> yeah, I was nine, and then I forgot who else beat me. I think it might have been Rick Lefevre or somebody that played really good at the time. Right. Um, but yeah, I didn't do good, but I had fun. It was a ball. Right. Did you ever play Alan Hopkins? Many times. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I did tough it to beat. with him last year. Yeah, he was always tough to beat. He had a very unorthodox style, but he was tough to beat. Right. He had a weird, a weird punch stroke, you know, and it you, you really, honestly, even though the man was a champion, you, you took him for granted a little bit just because he looked so awkward at the table. <laughs> he, as a matter of fact, he was one of the guys that I actually had trouble beating. Right. So. Ah. <laughs> Why is it doing that to me? I have it turned off. Anyhow, um, yeah, Ellen Hopkins is something else. He's, I really loved talking with him last year he was pretty amazing yeah he's a good guy i'd actually like to do what he does now i'd like to, to have an event somewhere right. we actually just have a, uh, a casino open up here the what is the casino uh, in gary or no hammond hard rock casino oh okay in hammond right outside of chicago and i would right. love to have a pro event there right it's a, it's a big, beautiful casino and I would like to do something like he does, have the amateurs there, the pros there, the booths right. and all that stuff. It's a big, long process. I'd have to get into it more. It probably won't happen for years, but right. at some point in my life, I would like to have some big event. I yeah. do have the uh, my eight ball tournament in Duluth, Minnesota. Uh -huh. um, Shane's played in that. Efren's been there. All the, all the top players go. But that's right. a pool room event. I would like to have a big major event at a casino. That would be right. I do. Yeah. Be a lot of fun. Yeah, it would It'd be a whole lot of fun. I had somebody contact me from down here at the Lake of the Ozarks that has a big resort, asking me if I knew anybody who knew how to run tournaments, and I didn't. But that would be that would be a nice spot too. Yeah. I just would have to find somebody that could help them out. But um, I think Patrick's got quite a bit of great stuff here for you. So All right. I'll go ahead and cut this short. Um, my husband just, he's an artist. He just turned on the music. So he's in there. Okay. Playing. So. All right. But, um, Thank you for the interview. And I hope that you have a good day. Let me know if you need anything at all. Okay, I will. Thanks, Dennis. All right. Have a good day. Okay, you too.